of the ball. This this is News Talk. Well, hello there everyone. So John Giles with us because it is of course a Thursday evening. John's on the way after nine o'clock. We have James e. O'Connor and Dennis Walsh casting an eye over the weekend's hurling. Once again, Munster really grabs the eye. Alan Quinlan in conversation with CJ Stander ahead of Leinster Munster. That's on the way around half past seven or so. And uh, Rex Hoggard will fill us in from day one at Beth Page Black, where frankly Brooks Kepke has uh, once again shown he is rather ridiculous. 53106, the text number. We are at Off The Ball on Twitter. Richie McCormick here in the studio, hello. How are you, Joe? And Dan McDonald, here are. Hi, Joe. On a Thursday. Yeah, well, well you be here on a Thursday. You're here on a Thursday, Thursday. Yeah. No, no, that's what I mean. I'm just, shocked. So, so that, was to a, be here. that was an introduction thrown in someone's direction, but it was really about the surprise that you've been here. <laughs> you <laughs> Definitely just, a You Thursday. just projected that onto someone else. Can yeah. you believe? I didn't know been Dan, here. I've been dragged in on yeah. a Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this show went on on Thursdays. It's, yeah, it's like on a Thursday of a major, you didn't really think this true, Joe, did you? No. No, well, uh, well, what's your excuse? Uh, I swapped with uh, young Nathan Murphy. He covered corporate Joe last uh, night. Was it? I was uh, presenting Dan the Rugby Players Ireland Awards at the Clayton Hotel on the Burlington Road. Uh, would that be the direct debit or cash or how would that be paid? Just whatever way. It's all about the gig. All sorts of ways. <laughs> it's all about the gig. Joe does it for the love <laughs> of rugby. A players' player of the year, James Ryan. Young player of the year, James Ryan. Did you get the balance right between you know? that sort of gentle style from the stage, making people laugh, making the guests feel comfortable, the interviews, did you, know you get what? it right? I, 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 was, um, I was very quietly and cautiously happy. I think it was very good. Joe Schmidt did uh, about 10 minutes on stage. What, stand up like? We were, kind of, we, we were sitting down, I said it at the start, we, we literally looked like the world's worst boy band. We were sitting there in our little Westlife stools. Uh, but he was in fantastic form and it, I think it's on, Virgin, it's on Virgin Media One at 10 o'clock on uh, tomorrow, Friday. And he spoke brilliantly about his son and, and just one or two anecdotes which were really powerful and kind of... Okay, hear, so it was actually being broadcast. It's slightly different to a more private awards do as such, you know what I mean? Where you can take on. a few more risks with stuff and... The camera's on, it wasn't live obviously, so you could yeah. kind of josh around a little bit and have a bit of fun. No, it was good, it was really good. And um, uh, Schmidt was really good. Conor O'Shea was inducted into the Hall of Fame. He spoke brilliantly, you know, he was, he was remembering his late father. Um, who had passed away, obviously, um, not so long ago, and he was remembering his first cap, looking at his father as he sang the anthem. You know, it was kind of really amazing memory. And Jack Cardy talked about, you know, his cousin who passed away a year ago, and how that's had a profound effect on him. He won the Supporters Player of the Year. So they were all, um, they were really good. Uh, Rob Carney had to come and accept uh, Jacob Stockdale's award for try of the year against New Zealand. He was like, these bloody young kids, they come along, they're younger, they're fitter, they want to take your place, and now I'm accepting his award for try of the year. Mm. So uh, it was good. Meanwhile, Dan, you were saying I didn't want to bother you outside because you looked like you were uh, finishing off some work. You were at a couple of the under seventeen games. Well, yeah, I went to some. I mean, I mean, I, I, I'll write something about it in due course. I was just trying to get. I mean, trying to see some games because some of like Europe's best young footballers are in Ireland at the moment and have been in Ireland over the last couple of weeks. And obviously, looking at there's other stuff going on with the FAI, so I probably haven't seen as much of it as you would have in, in another year. You know, so um, I got to see a couple of games today. Um, Hungary, Belgium, earlier on in Talca Park, which was like a fifth place playoff, but the winning team goes to Brazil for an under-17 World Cup later in the year, so there was a penalty shootout to decide that, so, you know, the Hungary players won the shootout and they're celebrating going to Brazil at the age of whatever, 16, later in this year, which isn't a bad old gig, and then there was a semi-final in, in Belfield this afternoon between Spain and Holland, both of which uh, are, are pretty good. Both teams are pretty decent, and the Dutch won. Uh, they got a last minute goal to go through, but I obviously missed it because I was coming here. Oh. But uh, but they're, they're they're a good Dutch side, and then France and Italy are playing tonight. And I, I gather the French are, are very good. I saw Italy play the other day, so I mean it's just strange. Like you know, there was a key. You know, you, you wonder. You, you hold on to these team sheets, and in years to come, it might become very significant. There was a key Yana Hoover playing for Holland today, who was already been involved with the Liverpool first team squad oh, in yeah. a cup game earlier this Wolves, year. Yeah. yeah, earlier this year, there was a guy playing. For Inter Milan the other day, uh, Esposito, who who played in the Europa League round of 16, and um, I think he was the first ever 2002 player to like be involved in a senior European uh, club tournament. So he was involved the other day. Um, you know, a couple of highly rated Spanish players today. So I think the, you know, over time, you'll you'll sort of remember some of the names that were here. There's a guy playing for France who's already broken the tournament record with nine goals, and uh, 
Adewish, is that I'm not sure about the first name, is PSG. So, uh, but like, like it is, you know, you look at Hungary today and you're seeing where are these players playing. Um, I mean, some of them are at decent clubs, some of them are, are modest enough Hungarian clubs, and you're trying to get a handle on development and style and where they're at and obviously our team got knocked out and maybe there would be a feeling that this Irish under 17 team there are slightly later developers they mightn't be like a great generation um, in terms of that their youthful promise although in time to come you never know uh, whereas our current under 19 side who go to Armenia in the summer are very highly regarded and that team have met in roads at first team level so you never know but like, there's big hype around these players a lot of scouts a lot of people I think Seamus Coleman I think I know I think Seamus Coleman and Sean Williams and Alex Pierce, a couple of the Ireland senior players, were at the, the game in Tolka, obviously doing a bit of homework to do with badges and licences and stuff like that. And uh, there were scouts from Manchester United there at the, the game in, in Belfield and you're trying to piece together who all these people are. So it's been a good competition um, and, and certainly in years to come, we'll be, people will be claiming they were there at games that they weren't actually at. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so I presume a pretty technical brand of football between those teams that you mentioned today. There was, although the thing is, Holland still had a striker playing up front um, who actually played who played for the Dutch last year against Ireland in that game where the, the controversial penalty shootout, the Jimmy Corcoran thing, where he was sent off during the shootout, and he is a 17-year-old striker, uh, the classic big man who they weren't afraid to go long and utilise this guy's pace and power when they wanted to. So okay. there's, there's all stereotypes about, yeah, of course, it's technical, but there's teams where aren't afraid to mix it up either yeah. as well, you know, and the Spanish players today hitting the odd diagonal ball and, like, they're not... It's not all just... Uh, Academy uh, football. No, no, there was a bit more to it than that, so it has been enjoyable. Let's get into Richie's news round. So Brooks Kepka has won three majors in no time and walks around with a slight chip on his shoulder because, frankly... Nobody's overly interested in Bruce Kepka, but if he keeps doing what he's doing, then he's going to be hard to ignore. And what he has done today at Bethpage Black is frankly extraordinary. Yeah, he's already going to take some catching this weekend. Cook has made an ideal start to his defence of the PGA Championship. An opening round 63 sees the American head the field there on seven under par. He's currently four shots clear of the field. Of the Irish involved today, Graham McDowell, he opened with a level par round of 70. Shane Larry had a disappointing day of 5 over 75 for the Clara man today. Uh, Rory McIlroy, he's made a disappointing start to his round, bogeying the first there. He's currently on to the third, while Patrick Harrington, for his part, he's currently level par and playing his fourth hole. An eagle three at the 517 yard par 5 fourth was the highlight of Tiger Woods' two over par opening round today of 72. They're still saying as the players go out, even now, par is a good score. Despite Kepka shooting 7 under, you just have to ignore that. Uh, frankly, he's ridiculous. He did an interesting interview a couple of months ago where he was asked about the fact that he tends to win majors more so than just your random PGA Tour mm. events. And he was saying, I don't mean to be cocky, but frankly, I just find this game so easy and I think I'm so much better than everyone <laughs> that at a normal PGA Tour event, if I'm not leading by kind of Friday evening, I'm like, ugh come on, and I get impatient and I start going for crazy shots. Whereas at a major, I have a bit more respect for the event, a bit, and I hang around a bit more, and I tend to win them. Be honest, Joe, that sounds a bit cocky. It does sound a bit cocky, <laughs> it does, yeah. Small bit cocky. It's a touch yeah. cocky. Uh, I, but I like the fact that like, he played in Europe when he was younger, that he sort of... Uh, Challenged he, he, her, yeah. yeah he, Learned he, his chops. Yeah, he sort of, uh, again, it's like the old under-17 thing. I'm sure a lot of people have watched him play in a gallery of three or four. I mean, there's a couple of stories about that, isn't there? Oh, Certain yeah. people who saw him and like, yeah, this guy's going to be a player. And Of course, sometimes people just say that, but I mean, he's definitely <laughs> proved out to be... Oh, man. He's not going to ruin this tournament, though, is he? I mean... There is a I, chance he will, I don't yeah. like... I don't like it when something no, like this a, happens. There's you know? a chance he will. There's a very good chance. Want to tune into this around Sunday at seven o'clock and like have a congested leaderboard and really, you know, a genuinely of, of, of the post Tiger era, which of which kind of Rory is one of the elder statesmen now, and Speed and all these guys, Justin Johnson. I think there's a real argument that Kepka of all of them is going to be the late runner to end up with the most majors. He's just a machine. There's literally no weakness to his game. Mentally, he is phenomenal. Even when he dunked it in twelve at Augusta, a horrible moment on a Sunday. He followed up with an eagle on 13. He's mm. just robotic, so uh, he's scary good. There is every chance he'll say, I'm leading, and go, damn right I am, and just keep on leading. He's not yeah. going to feel pressure. Yeah, uh, he, had, he had a few issues uh, in, in Augusta, though. He didn't, you know, he was in a good position. I know what you're saying, but like, yeah. he's, not, he's not You can't win penetrable. Like, you know, he, it is still a tough course, and it's still a long way to be out in front. You I, know? Saw, um, I saw Rory's first hole, the bogey one. 
it was just like, come on. So he, he, um, the drive goes into the rough, not massively into the rough, but it was, it, the first hole is one of the easier holes on the course, so you've got to kind of take advantage. So he went into the rough from about 100 yards from the green. He kind of hacked out of the rough, it's very thick, to about 20 yards short of the green. Hit a truly, by the uh, lofted standards we're talking about, truly terrible chip. Mm. Left himself 20 feet for a par. Missed that, tapped in for just a really ugly uh, bogey. His chipping last week at Quail Hollow was uh, very poor, so that was actually a worrying sign on his first hole. So we'll see how he gets on. That's the golf anyway. I've nattered on for long enough about that, Richie. You certainly have, Joe. Don't be self-conscious about it, Joe. Oh, yes, he's worried now. Yes. Larry says, evening, Joe. Just touching base to say I enjoyed your chat earlier on with Ivan Yates today about Bruce Kopika. It's fair to say Ivan was struggling with the correct pronunciation of uh, the name. <laughs> That's unlike Ivan. Okay. Uh, Limerick FC players. I, I literally just think he called me in to slag me. That, that's the only reason he now has me in to preview the golf, is to slag me and slag off the ball. He's like, what are you pious, righteous lot giving out about now? What are you on your high horse about now? I don't know if you've heard most of his guests. That's um, pretty much all of it goes. Uh, Limerick FC players say they've been left with no other option but to vote for strike action. A statement via the PFAI today claims the club are to pay wages and expenses for April, three weeks late on May the 23rd. They also say some players at the club have wages and expenses still outstanding from March, with players also paying their own physio bills. The players will strike if future payment dates are not honoured, but Saturday's game away to Cove does go ahead. Sean Russell was a guest of Off the Balls League of Ireland podcast recently, outlining how he'd been left with a bill for cruciate ligament surgery and he this week gave an update on his situation to Jamie. With regards to the actual club itself and the FAI, I haven't received any information other than uh, a club representative sent me a text message just saying that there was a solicitor's letter on the way to me. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what that means but I'm um, just awaiting that at the moment. Um, and then I had the experience uh, that the uh, f- expenses that I was owed for March had bounced on me in the meantime. So. Um, I was given those in check and uh, they bounced so at the moment I'm still waiting on uh, to hear back on the plan going forward in regards to the uh, outstanding payments, the next surgery and uh, starting an actual full rehab programme um, with a physio. Have you been looking into this? Yeah, I mean, this is a story that's been going on for a while and uh, you know, there's, there's got a while to run yet, I would have thought as well. Um, I mean, Limerick, I suppose I don't know, for one of the clubs that did release a statement uh, that was supportive of the FEI hierarchy during the recent crisis. Um, they did or didn't? Uh, they did. They, oh, they did. They did. They were, they were one of the two clubs that did, uh, Limerick and Waterford. Um, so... Uh, you know, there's obviously legacy issues here in the sense that, like Limerick, were a troubled club last year. They received the license this year, um, and yet within a short space of time after receiving the license, they've met uh, with payment issues. So that that doesn't just reflect badly on them; it reflects badly on the overall governance position of the league. So um, in another year, at another time, this is probably a bigger story, just in the sense that, you know, this would be the, the major major football story of the time, whereas almost now it's just been lumped yeah. into everything else that's going on. There's a lot of various things going on in Irish football at the moment that in another time would be a crisis in themselves, but now they're almost getting lost in the, the bigger picture because we're, we're resetting everything right now. We sure are. Man City then? Yeah, they say an investigation into alleged financial irregularities at the club contains mistakes, misinterpretations and confusions. The Premier League winners have been referred to UEFA's club financial control body to decide if they'll be punished for those alleged transgressions. City are accused of disguising millions of pounds worth of their own owners' investments as sponsorship deals and they deny all charges. The statement from City Today claims the referral ignores a comprehensive body of irrefutable evidence provided by Manchester City FC to the Chamber. Uh, Jacob Stockdale, he's been named at full-back for Ulster's Pro 14 semi-final meeting with Glasgow tomorrow night. The Ireland international hasn't played since last month due to a hamstring strain. While Louis Ludic is also fit to start, he starts on the wing with Rory Best skippering the side from Hooker. Bernard Jackman was on this morning's OTBM looking ahead to Saturday's semi-final meeting of Munster and Leinster. And the former Leinster hooker says the recent form of both Conor Murray and Jonathan Sexton may not be their own fault. I think Johnny hasn't played enough to, to judge him. Obviously, he was very good against Toulouse. Um, and then he hadn't really played until uh, we saw him against Saracens. He can't judge. I don't even judge Conor Murray or, or or Johnny Sexton too much this season because unfortunately they've been behind teams, uh, packs who've been beaten up, not set piece wise, but in general play. They just haven't been getting over the game line. They haven't been creating light and quick ball, and they're getting absolutely smothered. And um, I think it'll be interesting this week because 
Um, you know, they're very similar teams in terms of power output. Um, and Leinster historically have been able to get the, the or win the battle of the breakdown. Bar that game against against Munster in in, in Tolmond. But um, you know, if, if Munster gets front football, Conor Murray will have a great game. It's, and likewise for Le, for for Leinster with Johnny Sexton, I wouldn't have worries about their form really. On the Leinster Munster team, we'll bring you a chat Alan Quinlan had with CJ Stander, CJ Stander, uh, in about five, ten minutes' time. Yeah, and that old TBN clip from our Sports Breakfast show that airs every morning from 7.45. You can find it on offtheball.com, YouTube, Twitter and Facebook, so you can start your day with Off The Ball and you can see our social channels for full broadcast details. Uh, Dublin senior hurling selector Greg Kennedy is to spend the next month in the stands after being slapped with a four-week ban for intercepting play during the Leinster Championship meeting with Kilkenny last weekend. It's believed he won't contest the sanction. While well, Goalie football manager Kevin Walsh has made four changes to his side for Sunday's Connacht semi final with Sligo. Bernard Parr, Kieran Malloy, Gareth Bradshaw, and Fiontano Crane all come into a side given a fright by London in the quarter finals. Parr replaces Rory Lavelle in goal, while Malloy and Bradshaw are introduced to the half back line in place of David Wynne and Gary O'Donnell. The other change sees O'Crane introduced to a midfield in place of Podrick Cunningham. Galway were far from impressive in reaching the semi finals with a 16 points to 1 9 victory over London in Ryslip earlier this month. And with regular netminder Aidan Devaney absent through injury, Eamon Kilgallen starts in goal for Sligo. They're captained by Niall Murphy and the corner forward has, says that a proposed tiered championship could deprive them of games like the one upcoming in Markovich Park this Sunday. For likes of ourselves, like we, we start out the year in, in Division 3, obviously it's your dingo plan, but you're playing those teams on a similar uh, standard towards yourselves and then you have to go into a championship game and prepare for possibly the likes of goal with this year and you haven't played anyone of that calibre yet. But if you were to play in maybe more of a league form come championship as well and play it out those teams of a, of a better grade, you're ultimately going to improve as a player and as a team and give yourself a better chance going forward. Uh, staying out west, and Emlyn Mulligan has withdrawn from the Leitrim football panel. The 31-year-old came off the bench in their Connacht quarter-final loss to Ross Common last weekend and has decided to opt out for the rest of the year. Mulligan says that his three separate cruciate injuries have caught up with him, telling the Irish Sun that his cameo against Ross Common probably informed his decision. He hasn't ruled out a return, but will concentrate instead on his club Melvin Gales. Arsenal say they're bitterly disappointed that only 6,000 tickets have been made available to their fans for this month's Europa League final with Chelsea. UEFA insists logistical issues have prevented them from allowing more supporters to travel to the stadium in Baku. Arsenal have queried the criteria by which venues are selected for European finals, despite their then-chief executive, Ivan Gazidis, sitting on the UEFA Executive Subcommittee when Baku was chosen as this season's Europa League final venue. Yeah, I mean, that the, the, the Ivan Gazidis factor sort of weakens their case somewhat in terms of the queries. Their bluster yeah. is kind of uh, softened a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we know that UEFA, you know, like when we can't actually speak ill of UEFA, I mean, they are looking after us at the moment here in Irish football, so let's not, let's not be too unkind to our UEFA paymasters here. Gotta love the but, Troika. But, um, I mean, they've played the political game to shop finals around for whatever reason. I mean, we'd, we'd like to believe that, you know, Dublin gets selected for stuff because, you know, we're just a great logistical venue. But obviously there's politicking that goes on with all of these things and people get their turn. And Baku's made uh, massive plays for these kind of things for yeah, the past five years. They have the whole European Olympics and various other yeah. events, don't they? Um, and ultimately, and my argument with this is, yeah, it's bitterly disappointing for Arsenal, bitterly disappointing for Chelsea, you know, but would they have an issue with, say, Azerbaijan's interest in football if someone from there rang up and offered them absolutely loads of money as a sponsor? They would not. No. They wouldn't care. So, um, you know, you can talk about spreading the message, but, you know, uh, I don't know. Like, the, the, any moral argument from fans of Arsenal, Chelsea, and any big six club, and anyone that's moving towards European Super Leagues or whatever, to me, they don't give a crap about supporters, really. So, I mean, they're, they're doing this now for posturing, but really they don't care about the direction of football generally. So, I don't really care about their complaints. Good. Ross makes a point which I must say crossed my mind as well, Dan. So, Dan is thinking about producing an article to do with the under-17s. Does this mean he spent the day out in the sunshine watching football with nothing to show for it at the end of the day? That's a soft Thursday, Dan. Very soft. I wish. I agree, I Ross. Wish. There was a lot of other... Uh, a lot of other stories and, and stuff ongoing at the moment today. He's musing on the possibility of writing go, something small well, it's not on even the under-17s. You, you no, you, Dan, you do what you got to do. Uh, there's an element of this under-17 tournament of, of seeing what's going on, you know? Seeing what's going on in the context of the bigger picture within Irish football right there now. Might, there might be nothing going on, and in which yeah. case you can't be expected to write anything. Mm. Kieran says Brooks Kepp is like a Mars bar. Ruthlessly effective, but a bit dull. I'm, 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 I find That's the, harsh in the Mars bar. I find Brooks Deep pretty Deep fried when he goes to Scotland. As well, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Have one. No. 
Have you? No, absolutely willing to try, but never have one. No, never. If anybody wants to provide a batter Mars bar for the off the ball crew tonight, we are available for oh, batter no, Mars bar offers. No, don't do we that. We are, Joe. We're not. We are. Most of us are. Uh, Bruce, travel well. It's there's a... lads out there haven't eaten in days. Brooke, yeah. Brooks Kepka is actually interesting. When you, he's, what he is is uh, like you know the way Tiger is like nerd turned alpha male weights, but he's actually you know he was very much a nerd as a kid and social outcast. Uh, in Kepka, you have proper alpha male jock, and he looks around at his fellow golfers with a slight sense of disdain and almost embarrassment that he's part of this wussy sport. So he is just <laughs> the words of Joe Malloy. Don't be so harsh on yourself, Joe. He is just kind of swaggering out there with his cowboy walk, and he wants to literally beat the crap out of all of them. And but I was, find it fascinating. Was there a bit of post Ryder Cup like salacious gossip involved in Brooks Kepka? Him well? and DJ went at it in a plane. Yeah, and then but then they denied it. Like he wanted to be interested, and then there was an interesting story, and then he like. What is it with this theme of like frat boys that are representing the US at the minute? When you consider like yeah, Patrick like, Reed's kind of viewed with those glasses as well. And Reed, Reed Reed's more a, of an outcast. Reed is a genuine outcast. Yeah, yeah Reed is. Uh, Reed would be the, next door to the frat boys. Kepka's quite well liked. Yeah, Reed's not involved. In, like the he's, Justin, he's, Justin, he's, Justin he's, Thomas and um, George Fowler. What's happening here? So Patrick Reed's Reed on the on the outside of the house. Sort of wants to be in. Completely different. Wants different to be character. in, but also a bit of a loner. You have Justin Thomas and Speed and Fowler. You know, jumping into the pool, frat boyish. And you have Saved Brooks. By the you have Brooks Kepka and Dustin Johnson. Not as smart as the Justin Thomas Spieth crew in the frat boy house. They're sort of outside looking over going, oh, they're such nerds. Right, Joe. If the That's the general <laughs> situation. If the TV slash award show compare stuff doesn't <laughs> yeah. necessarily pan out, can I just put it to you? You should possibly think about sitting down and writing Caddyshack 3. Well, yeah. I'm just, that is the array of characters. And I, so the, the Kepka... Piece Johnson. them together the jigsaw of the yeah, PGA like, Tour. Yeah. Uh, all this week, by the way, we're teaming up with Skoda. We're sending one lucky off-the-ball listener to the Tour de France... It's a great prize, a VIP end of week prize, so uh, giving it away tomorrow. Includes two nights in a hotel, helicopter ride and a bike ride with a former Tour de France winner. All the thanks to Skoda. Book your next service at skodaservice.ie to be in the draw. Just identify our mystery voice who gave us this summary of the uh, classic children's book, Watership Down. Rabbits are dying. <laughs> Rabbits are dying. <laughs> That is <laughs> sensational. <laughs> Rabbits are dying. What was he talking about? Where did that come from? <laughs> JP actually pitched this one out in the office earlier on. He had to kind of ask, Does is, is water, people get Watership Down? I don't know. Yeah. I want another context to that, Cliff. Did you know the guy who wrote Bright Eyes, which was the team tune to Watership Down, also wrote the team tune to Big Break? Like no. that. There's a fact for you. No, I don't know. What, what is the Watership Down theme tune? Bright Eyes. Theme tune. Burning like fire. Sang by Art Garfunkel. No, that didn't do it. That didn't... As good as that was, Richie, that didn't quite twig it. You're going to have to sing Big Break for him now as well. <coughs> <laughs> the theme tune. Now we're, now we're talking. <laughs> uh, this is an important competition, so I should, I should continue. One last time. Rabbits are dying. Text your name and answer to 53106 for 30 cents and we'll announce the overall winner on tomorrow night's show. And remember, if you want to enjoy the expertise of Skoda technicians, book your service at skodaservice.ie. John Giles is going to be on the football show this evening. Up next, Alan Quinlan in conversation with CJ Stander. Off the ball on News Talk. Future proof. You're taking a stroll on your honeymoon with your new husband on a remote tropical island when who do you bump into but your first serious boyfriend.